Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, just a few housekeeping issues as we get started here today. Uh, please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're joining us from. We'd love to hear that. Uh, please, if you're not speaking, um, mute your microphone. Uh, you will have an opportunity to ask questions either through your microphone or via the chat later on in the presentation. Uh, throughout the presentation, please feel free to put any questions into the chat and we'll get back to them at the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Uh, we are recording the session today and the recording will be posted on eCampus Ontario's Adaptive Learning webpage and our YouTube channel. And uh, a link for the slides for today's presentation is being posted in the chat uh, right now as well. So hello everyone and welcome to eCampus Ontario's webinar on adaptive learning using AR and VR simulations for active learning. Uh, my name is Don Eldridge and I am a digital learning associate on the programs and services team here at eCampus where I work primarily on the adaptive learning portfolio. It gives me great pleasure to be moderating today's webinar and to introduce you to our main presenters. Uh, joining us today is Teresa Stagger, Dean of Program Planning, Development and Renewal at St. Lawrence College. Uh, Teresa is particularly interested in developing innovative and flexible educational opportunities that respect the diversity of learners and their personal goals. Uh, she embraces the challenge of meaningfully integrating technology to create authentic workplace simulations to prepare learners for ongoing success in their careers. And representing today's featured technology is Harrison Olajo, CEO and co-founder of Up360, a Toronto-based agency that focuses on building high-end interactive virtual reality simulations in partnership with colleges, universities, and corporations across North America. They are an end-to-end -end service provider helping organizations with everything from content design and development through to distribution and support. So welcome, Teresa and Harrison. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and honor that the offices of eCampus Ontario are located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse nations, Inuit and Métis. I recognize and am grateful for the legacy of all past, present, and future generations of the First Peoples of this land. I'm joining you today from Fort Francis, Ontario, which is situated in the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and Métis people, where it is my great privilege to live, work, and learn. In this virtual space, we are all convening from different places, and this is one of the things that makes the online environment special. I invite you to share your own land acknowledgement in our chat. So to provide a little bit of context uh, around today, adaptive learning platforms are educational technologies that assess a learner's knowledge, identify skills gaps, and provides personalized instructional paths towards learning outcomes. Overlapping with adaptive learning are other technologies such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, and intelligent tutoring systems. Often experiential in nature, these technologies are grounded in competency-based instruction and move the learner towards mastery through ongoing practice and immediate feedback. Among the many benefits of adaptive learning, these technologies have been shown to improve learning efficiency, knowledge transfer, and learner engagement. eCampus Ontario has been working in the adaptive learning space for the past several years, where we see these technologies as an important and emerging part of the digital transformation of higher education. You can see details about our work by visiting our adaptive learning webpage at the link being posted in the chat. For the remainder of today's webinar, we will hear from St. Lawrence College and UP360. Their collaboration, which benefited in part from the province of Ontario's historic $70 million investment in the virtual learning strategy, uses UP360 VR and AR technologies to enhance program delivery and learner engagement. This platform offers a scalable, cost-effective, and measurable way to train and assess individuals. Further, it can easily validate core competencies and provide micro-credentialing in programs. During the presentation, we will hear about how St. Lawrence College has worked with UP360 to integrate CanCred badging issue issuance into virtual simulations. I stop, I'm gonna stop sharing now and uh, hand things over to uh, Teresa and Harrison, take it away.
Okay, Harrison's just um, getting the screen share up, so I hope everyone can see it. Yeah, you're and, good to go. Okay, great. And thanks everyone for joining today. We will have um, plenty of time, I think, for questions at the end as well. Um, we do have an agenda for today's session. And um, Harrison, if you can go to the next slide, we'll share that with everyone. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the micro credentials at St. Lawrence College and the um, andragogy that we use to support um, both the development and the delivery of, of the micro creds. Um, also, the connection of micro credentials to digital badging. Um, SLC has a long history with um, UP360. Uh, um, you know, they're our, our go to partner. <laughs> Um, for all things uh, digital, and so we'll we'll uh, chat a little bit about uh, the history of that. Share some of our project examples, um, and move on to talking about how we're um, measuring success um, and competencies within virtual reality environments, and particularly how we're um, doing that and intersecting that with. Um, automated issuing of micro creds and, and our digital badge as, as a result of this eCampus project. And um, just our ongoing next steps and goals, which um, who knows what kind of collaboration that will um, lead to in this large group. So just so everyone understands, because I know that there's different approaches to micro credentials at different institutions, and we do um, try to follow the um, the eCampus framework for micro credentials. One of the things that we're really clear about is that post secondary institutions have a um, qualifications framework that allows us to deliver lots of other kinds of credentials. Micro credentials then do not need to be courses or or full programs. So our micro credentials, when they're standalone, are short, less than a course. Um, they are stackable, so multiple micro credentials could stack towards a course, um, a, a more traditional, I guess, post secondary course, and many of them could stack towards other kinds of credentials, including local board certificates on um, certificates of um you know ontario ultimately i guess ontario college certificates um we hope to get to a place where we can stack towards many ontario um college credentials the micro credentials are competency based so um just to clarify that everything that we're asking learners to do to demonstrate the learning that happens within a micro credential is attached to something they would do in a workplace so an actual competency performance in a workplace setting uh, we develop micro credentials that are focused on in-demand workplace skills so they're all developed in partnership with industry we do a fair bit of consultation for all of our micro credentials with um, employers in the field and, um, you know, in often innovators in the field who are looking at workplace skills, both in demand immediately, but in demand in the future. Um, in terms of our virtual reality and, and augmented reality experiences, we're always trying to simulate real world learning um, opportunities, so tasks that you have to do in the workplace and the diversity of those tasks that are um, to do in the workplace. And we'll talk a little bit about that more when we get into the andragogy itself. Uh, our micro credentials include both learning and assessment experiences. So there's um, an opportunity for learning and practice, and then there's an opportunity for assessment. So in terms of our andragogy, so learning for adult learners, we're aiming to create micro credentials that are available in the moment that a learner recognizes the need for them to either get them entry into a workplace position, um, get advance their skills with within a current job, or maybe to um, upskill uh, to take on a new job. So, in time, 
We have continuous enrollment for, for um, the vast majority of our micro creds. They're self-paced and we embed variability into the actual um, design. And so in this case, in the back end design of our virtual reality experiences, and I think SLC probably, or I'm up 360 probably gets tired of us asking about this, but we're constantly saying, okay, so how can it vary so that every time a learner goes into the experience, it's different. They're faced with a new challenge. Um, the practice experiences that they get are, are different. There's always like an element of, of surprise or unexpected challenge that they need to respond to within that environment. And that supports us so that um, learners can practice in there. And not only do they not get bored, but they also can't just memorize one particular script and then be successful on that same script in an assessment. Um, each time they go in, again, they're gonna be doing something slightly different. Um, they are automated for timely feedback and many of them allow for the learner then to use that um, and adapt their performance right within the moment of, of the simulation. Um, and adaptive, obviously adaptive performance by the learner, but um, we have some things where based on where the learner um, selections they make or performances that they do, then um, the system adapts and, and presents them with a different kind of uh, challenge, I guess. Uh, so for all of our micro credentials, we it issue, they are aligned with a digital badge with CanCred. We issue those digital badges at the completion of the micro credential. It's very clear within that system what the competencies are that are required to earn the badge. Um, and then the digital badges, we've uh, worked with CanCred to actually align those to different standards so we can include essential employability skills, align our competencies to those as well, as well as the UN goals for sustainability. So those are two of the um, additional frameworks we've aligned all of our learning to. Uh, as I mentioned, UP360 um, and SLC have been working together since 2016. Uh, we've built a range and you're gonna see quite, quite a, a diversity of, of digital assets that we use um, across all different subject areas. And we're constantly working together to kind of push the boundaries and say, can we do this? Can we try this? Um, I think it's a learning process for all of us. Um, I've learned about, about maybe some of the limitations of VR, what's appropriate to do within a VR context, what maybe doesn't give any value added, um, where there is value added. We've, again, designed things that um, truly have alternatives um, to placement experiences, um, and I guess expansion of things that we would think about as placement experience. So, so that when learners do go out to a placement or do go out to the workplace, they've actually had a fair bit of, of simulated workplace experience. And, and this gives them more than what they might have in our shops, um, in our labs, and again, in our placements. Um, do we have video for these ones? Uh, I've got one for, for, for metallurgy uh, and I can play it here. Uh, Music okay. City, we, we don't have one, but maybe okay. if you want to explain what Music City was first and then okay. uh, I'll flip to the video of metallurgy. Okay, that's great. Um, I love Music City. <laughs> so we had this vision of a um, immersive three-dimensional city that people would travel around and it's related to a course, a, a general education course in um, the impact of music on society. So we had a very big vision of how people could travel around a city and understand um, how music was, the intersection between music and 
social change um, and social events. We didn't, given the time limitations that we had to create this, have the freedom to do a, a VR environment, although we're still working with um, Up360 around that. But in this case, what we did was a desktop version, which you can click on different buildings in a city and then be actually immersed within that that building itself and so we've got like a um, vinyl store where you can sort through albums and literally play things it pulls from spotify so you can sort through almost every kind of music you can um, sort by artist you can sort by album um, there's a recording studio there's like a community um, open concert venue where we have things like from um, you know, famous uh, world impacting concerts across the world. Uh, we've got opportunities to do radio interviews. Uh, trying to think we've got a link to a fashion store where music artists influence fashion. Uh, so quite a number of different things and students actually travel through that. And it's really a self-directed course in that they can explore whatever they music they want and still meet the outcomes of the course. They can travel to different parts of the um, city and still meet the outcomes to the course. And we've used like a music newsstand as a way to share text documents or, or um, content that the instructors in the course really felt might be important for learners to read. Um, SLC Metallurgy, you have a video for that one, Harrison? Yeah, there's no sound on the video, Teresa, so I'll just let it play in the background if you want to talk about it a little bit. Okay. Uh, this is to give uh, some of our learners who are working on um, some workplace skills experience within our, our um, metal labs. And so there's heat ovens. I don't know what we're going to see here, but... Um, this one... Obviously, that's a level. <laughs> uh, so you could actually observe changes in metals as they're being heated here. It's a little bit like a, an AR environment. Um, and this gives them a chance to work on some of the equipment that is both expensive and and time consuming for them to do this all in the shop we did this part as part of COVID as well so we had our shop instructors come in and, and they were able to do some of the video taping that's in here that you can see a 3d model of a um, milling machine handle for exploration so they they get exposure to the parts they get exposure to the equipment that's in there um, and there actually is some sequencing testing that happens as part of procedures within, within this environment. Yeah, and one, one important thing to mention about uh, this one, as well as Music City, is they're, they're both web-based simulations, um, where it's, it's interactive web, so there's no downloads required on this. They could just open it via like a web, any web browser. Um, and then again, get that, you know, certain level of immersiveness uh, and, you know, presented with, you know, non-traditional resources, like the ability to actually like walk through uh, a digital twin of, of um, the lab that SLC has uh, for their metallurgy course, uh, while also being presented with and exploring um, like more traditional uh, 2D resources that are linked to all the different 3D assets and, and objects in this one. And then uh, we'll talk about some of our VR, our PC VR sims. Um, I'll play another video of this one, Teresa. This is our event planning. Again, the videos don't have audio, but uh, just something to see and look through while people are, uh, or while, while you're talking on it a little bit. Okay, so this one's named event planning, but we actually have this set up in a much larger, um, I don't know, immersive environment. We'll, 
I, I don't know, for the sake of this presentation, we'll talk about it as, as event planning, but it, it moves to wellness center space set up as well. There's other environments, but in here we had an outdoor and an indoor venue that we could have people set up for um, like restaurant celebrations for any kind of event planning, conference planning. And the learners can sort through um, a series of assets and then literally click on them, set them up for um, within the space and try to create particular themes with them based on, on the available quote pieces of furniture. Um, they can explore issues of accessibility within the space. They can explore things like lighting, um, electrical outlets. So you may want to set something up um, where, you know, there's a, a band or where there's a screen share within a, um, a like a business conference. And, you know, you might be restricted because of the accessibility of outlets within the space so we've got all of these kind of constraints and it's meant for people to problem solve and then articulate and explain why they've made the decisions that they've made yeah and, and one uh, really neat thing about this one um beyond like stability with like the environments that we could feed into it and the assets that we could feed into it um is the is kind of the the, the learning outcomes um it's set up in a way where students actually like take screenshots and videos of of the, the the worlds that they create and then those screenshots and videos would then be submitted to um you know the instructor of, of the relevant courses to actually be able to look at and assess and and you know consider all those different elements that go into things like event planning and space planning So you can imagine the impact of this for our hospitality programs, our tourism programs. Um, again, it grew out of a wellness um, idea that we we have a much bigger um, wellness environment where people might want to set things up for um, group counseling is, is one of the things that could happen in there, just parent and family um, interactions. I mean, family and child interactions. So, um, okay, so this is um, a food prep simulation. It's part of, again, this is one experience within a larger VR environment. The goals here are to adapt. We have some that are just about basic food prep, but because, and I mentioned the thing about um, restrictions within a VR environment, um, things like really fine chopping of, of a particular food <laughs> is not something that you would ask people to do in a VR environment that is simulated in here, but the skill of that would still be done in the culinary lab. So in this space, what we were really looking for is for people to follow the proper steps um, and safety measures. So there actually is like a oven mitt on there. <laughs> um, safety measures for preparing food and they have to do um, menu adaptations for people with dietary or restrictions or food preferences and so they have a recipe but someone comes in and says you know I need a low sodium I'm on a low sodium di diet or I've got an allergy to nuts what are you going to do um, instead and so they look through and they plan the substitutes for that recipe based on um, their clients, you know, again, preferences or restrictions. And part of what they have to do there in that menu is justify their substitutions. And then there, it's also obviously integrated with particular steps um, for preparing the meal. Yeah, and, and uh, to Teresa's point, like we've also used this environment for things like uh, food quality insurance inspections. Um, so we, we found a lot of really creative ways to, you know, build build one environment uh, and implement it and use it across a whole variety of courses. Um, so this one, you know, it doubles up from like just 
again, learning some of these basic food prep things to, you can also play the role of like uh, an inspector and, you know, go around and, and look for, you know, health and safety infractions and, and, you know, different things that you would need to look out for if you were, a, you know, a quality assurance inspector. So if you see a mouse running around in there, or you see mold within the kitchen, that's planned. <laughs> but just to give an example, that wouldn't be in every scene. So a student could go in to do the food ins or the inspection, the quality assurance inspection. And one time they would go in, they, there would be a mouse that they would see. Another time there would be mold, but it wouldn't be the same every time. Um, this is a carpentry environment. We have. Um, multiple micro credentials again within this carpentry space and it supports we also have some desktop applications as well so this is a framing um, experience and you could see there's some follow-up checking um, repair the learner has an opportunity to fix that if they make a mistake and improve um, and they're given blueprints. And again, the blueprints could be different every time. Um, they get to pick the materials. There is a safety experience as well. So they, they must both prepare to start the simulation by putting on the right um, equipment. And then they have to follow all the safety tasks um, related to the equipment use. Um, in this one, there is some interaction with um, a site supervisor. I'm not exactly sure if they call that a four person, but it is um, the site supervisor at the site. So sometimes they would have to report or they have to put back a piece of equipment that's malfunctioning. Um, that would be one of the randomizations that we build in is something just isn't quite working right. And they've got to figure out what that is, is that a material flaw? Is that a machinery flaw? Yeah, and, and that one uh, has been a multi-year project. Like we, we started with, you know, introduction to hand tools and hand tool safety. Uh, and then you get introduced to um, power tools. And then from the power tools, like you're learning and cutting all the pieces of wood that you'll need for the third part, which is that that framing stuff that you saw there. Um, and, and that one was one of like multiple trades experiences that, that we worked on. Uh, we would need more than an hour to show you everything. Um, but, you know, that spread of projects, um, I think bridges in to nicely, uh, you know, what I wanted to talk about a little bit, which is metrics in VR and um, how all of this kind of feeds into uh, this, this eCampus project that we got funded to do. Um, because like across just that little snippet of projects that we've worked on, um, you know, we really started to see some trends in terms of like the, the types of metrics that we have to deal with, um, you know, things like numbers, uh, being like, you know, time, time variables, score variables, you know, angles, distance, you know, we did some welding simulations that actually, you know, tell you how, you know, long your weld was, you know, the, the distance, the angle, um, you know, you have letter based metrics that can just be like somebody's username or credential or like a little simple blurb of like, did somebody remember to, um, you know, put on their safety equipment. Uh, and then you also got into like media, you know, dealing with screenshots and videos and, you know, heat maps and, and you know, 3D objects and um, the, the diversity of types of metrics we had to deal with over the last uh, several years became very, very vast. And, um, you know, Teresa kind of laughed a little bit there at, at the beginning around like, uh, you know, that that constant back and forth between us and, and, and the college to try to refine, you know, what metrics are we sending, why are we sending them, um, and what's the best way to send them over to the credentialing platform. Uh, the screenshot you see here is actually a piece of a uh, carpentry assessment. Um, so in a lot of cases to just keep it simple, um, because we didn't have any of the infrastructure, we would just, you know, do things like display it in the simulation, uh, in real time. So users had the ability to, you know, correct those mistakes or, you know, potentially display it at the end of the simulation. Um, this was good in the beginning, uh, but it wasn't great if an instructor needed to actually review it, um, or if you actually wanted to treat this like a little bit more of a, of a formal assessment. Uh, so we played around with the idea of, you know, let's send these metrics to an email that could be a professor's email that could be, um, you know, a student's email, but, you know, this required internet at all times. Um, and 
it also required us to you know hard program those variables like into the actual experience itself um so we were like well let's try saving it to devices uh and this solved some of the other problems but it left a lot of um user error uh to the thing because you know a student would have to then go into the proper file you know find their screen capture and then you know submit that screen capture potentially in like an lms somewhere as, as if they were to submit like an assignment uh, so we thought, okay, well, what if we just like send this directly to, um, you know, the learning management system, but we very, very quickly learned that LMSs tend to change fast and a lot of times, um, you know, LMSs will will slightly vary from like one instructor to the next, uh, and there's still a lot of heavy lifting uh, to try to, you know, make that direct connection, depending on the platform and like all the nuances around it. So you know, we, we kind of just were faced with this problem of like, okay, how do we deal with metrics? Um, because every time we need to change these parameters, you know, regardless of the way we tried to save the parameters and send the parameters, we had to actually like go into a project, you know, make the updates in the project, re repackage the project, and then push a new version of the project to the computers. Um, and for anybody who has dealt with, uh, you know, PC based VR, um, it's a bit of a nightmare to do version control, uh, especially if you are dealing with a lot of computers and a lot of different devices across potentially a lot of departments. Um, so we had seen a call for proposals come up with eCampus uh, for this fund. And we basically, you know, posed a solution to this problem of like, how do we simplify the process of handling metrics for both us as a content creation studio uh, well, making sure that our partners, uh, and in this case SLC, had unlimited flexibility uh, in terms of, you know, everything surrounding those metrics, where they went, how they triggered badges and all that fun stuff. Um, so we were, we had metrics, and then we had a badging system, uh, and in this case, it was CanCred that we kind of posed as the, um, the example for the project. I'll try not to get too technical in terms of <clears throat> what it is we actually built and, and how we approach the problem and the solution to the problem. Um, but if for anybody who wants to, to nerd out with me a little bit later and go you know, into the technicals, I'm happy to elaborate. But the most simplified way to explain um, what we did was kind of in this little diagram that I'll show you. So we had the metrics. And all of these metrics essentially lived in one of these simulations. Uh, most of the simulations that we dealt with were, were um, desktop simulations. So those traditionally are like a little um, EXE file that gets downloaded on the computer uh, that gets exported from the game engine that we build it in. Uh, so the metrics ultimately live in the simulation. You know, and again, metrics could be a combination of any different thing rather than locking ourselves to sending it directly to um the system first like you know cancred or or blackboard or d2l or like one of those platforms uh we said let's put a platform uh in between where they need to go and the experience uh so that every time you know Teresa and her team comes to us and says hey can we like you know adjust these variables adjust those variables uh we would be able to um adjust the metric parameters. Uh, and then in the web version, uh, it would change the way we send, um, you know, triggers to an external system like CanCred to issue badges. So the way we handled this was again, we have metrics that live in the simulation. We would essentially uh, create metric IDs in the web platform. You know, that would be metric one, metric two, metric three. And then we could create a set of custom parameters for each metric um, and parameters could look like anything. So it could be, you know, if metric one is equal to yes, if metric uh, two, you know, is equal to or less than 50 or metric two is equal to or, you know, uh, less than 100. Um, we could customize those in a essentially in an infinite way uh, and create as many of these parameters as we want. And then we could take groupings of these parameters um, and create custom triggers. And the groupings of parameters could trigger different things. So, uh, you know, we use carpentry as an example where, um, you know, one uh, use case of carpentry 
maybe needs two metrics to issue a beginner carpentry badge, uh, but then another version of that for maybe say high school students uh, needed a different set of parameters to issue like an introductory badge. Um, so ultimately we built this framework through a lot of trial and error and a lot of trying to like grossly oversimplify things and get to like the very, very foundational side of things uh, to be able to move the need to go into the projects every single time and put that intermediary between again the simulations that get built or the content creators that are building the simulations and the platform where they'll eventually end up so that we could make fast rapid you know quick iterations um you know within a matter of minutes uh, every time you know we wanted to explore or change the parameters of like how these badges were triggered so essentially this platform that we built automated the whole process. Um, the version of the platform that we created uh, as part of the project looked like this. And this was probably about a year ago, maybe even two now. Uh, time is flying very fast. So sometimes I lose track of how long it's been, but it was this system that again, allowed us to go in, create metric keys uh, and hard code our experiences to point those metrics into um, this web-based system and we called it the immersive learning platform or the ILP for short and set up in a way there that it would work for our studio, but also every other development company or every other institution that was building these um, VR desktop based simulations and we're running into the same challenges that that we ran into. We played with it for the last year or so. Um, and ultimately, the direction that we're taking it uh, is a little bit more. Um, holistic and a little bit more uh, wider reaching because, you know, handling metrics became one part of the problem, but we really quickly, uh, you know, realized that there were a lot of other moving pieces that we felt were, um, you know, were challenges that we were facing with St. Lawrence College, but the more we talked to you know, other developers, the more we talked to other college partners, it became abundantly clear that you know these problems were across the board. So we we took the framework for handling metrics and we, we've kind of baked that into the second version of, of this immersive learning platform that we, we put together. Um, and we now are you know approaching it in a way where it makes content management easy from the time we actually build it and are testing it with our partners. Uh, all the way through to the time we're ready to potentially distribute it to partners outside of the original institution, um, making metric, metric integration easy and you know how we deal with those metrics easy. And then for all of our educational partners, it makes it really, really easy to kind of follow that flow of content management, device management, user management, um, and again, give them com complete control over that credentialing process. So on the fly, if they wanted to, uh, again, you know, add extra content into new courses or you know, adjust the parameters around badges, uh, they would essentially be able to do all this through the web uh, and allow content to be more widely used. Um, because again, these simulations, they, type, they take a lot of time and energy and resources to build. So the more creative ways we can find to use them across you know, different um, different subject matters, you know, different levels of education from, from, you know, adult learners to, you know, students in college through to high school students, uh, the more value, uh, you know, SLC and our college partners, you know, get out of the content. So we're trying to take from our learnings from this first version of the platform. And again, really just build it out in a way where, uh, it solves a lot of that, um barrier to entry for for colleges and and for you know educators and trainers that want to somehow figure out how to use uh, immersive learning uh, within the context of, of education and training um and then uh you know kind of looking forward um you know we have a lot of really fun interesting projects that we're still uh you know working on with slc uh you know some are interactive web uh some are you know desktop based some are vr based um and we're trying to find ways to leverage a lot of this existing content that we've already built um into other slc programs now that we've built some of this uh infrastructure behind the scenes um and we're exploring things like adaptive micro credentials for um high school students so again how do we simplify the parameters around something like this framing experience or or this electrical experience uh, to a point where a high school student would be able to potentially use it for some level of learning uh, or somebody going through like a workforce development or an employment center would be able to use it for some level of learning um, and it's 
again, a big learning process. You know, there's no hard and fast way to, to, to do this. Um, so we very much are kind of still learning as we're going. Uh, and you know, I think Teresa will be the first to say that like, you know, we, we've seen a lot of success out of this, but we still definitely have a lot to learn. Um, so we're just trying to really, you know, go slow uh, and kind of walk before we run here. And then also, uh, you know, take all of these learnings and try to solve problems, uh, you know, as we progress projects forward and share what we're, you know, what we're learning with, with other partners along the way, uh, because, you know, we both kind of have a goal to, to get immersive learning technologies and these interactive web technologies, you know, into as many uh, places as possible. And the only way to do that is, is through, you know, collaborations and partnerships. And, you know, I saw a lot of participants in here today from um, some of the other, uh, you know, collaborative partnerships that we, we have on the go uh, with SLC, you know, Georgian College, Mohawk, some power engineering stuff. Uh, so it's really all about, you know, building some of these tools uh, to, to solve some of these bigger problems so that we can move um, e-learning forward as a whole and, and, you know, make education more accessible to people who are, you know, non-traditional learners. And I'm just going to jump in there too, to say like one of the challenges, and I, I responded to a question Annie asked in the chat is, um, you know, at, at this point, we are kind of tied to offering our VR equipment on campus. We've got a mobile lab. We've got a couple of mobile labs where we take that equipment out. And so we're able to um, make the, the VR experiences more accessible to others. We've got some partnerships with um, other institutions where they've got their own VR equipment so we can link out our resources and they and they can use them, but um, not every student's got that equipment, right? So there's always that piece around how do you make this accessible? And um, you also don't necessarily wanna just distribute it free widely. And <laughs> for everyone who does have a, a, a you know their own headset so there's there's those kinds of of challenges um there was another question in the chat too that i just want to address so it was about um creating vr content and i maybe this goes back to the piece about what's what we find is worth investing in in vr and what we find is not like we don't use vr environments to quote present content in a in a traditional way like we use the vr environment as an application of practice of of skills and competencies so if there's quote content knowledge to be acquired in advance of that um you know we try to present that in a, in another environment first and and in in most cases because we're limited in terms of um you know, investment in VR is one of the the um, limits there is we don't want people coming into an immersive environment just being presented with text or, you know, watching a, a lecture video in there or, you know, even a even a demo video like the, what's the value of that within the VR. So we're really um, strategic about what we do in the VR and it's an opportunity for practice. Um, and we are just working on some multiplayer things right now. Yeah, J James had a question there about uh, single users versus multiplayer. So yeah, like Teresa said, we're in the middle of um, working on some some new multiplayer uh, experiences. Uh, and the nice thing with with some of the infrastructure that we're building behind the scenes is once we have a multiplayer network, you know, fully up and running, um, it becomes relatively plug and play. So, you know, all projects moving forward theoretically could, you know, be, be uh, multi-user if we wanted it to. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, we have another question uh, in here, just in terms around one is a kind of the budget uh, to create something like the metallurgy lab, as an example, uh, is there kind of a timeline, resources, funding, like to create these? And I guess my, I, by extension, I have a question around this too. Is is there a place where educators can find some of these ready-made assets that could be without having to create them integrated into an existing curriculum? Is could, can you shed any light on that? Um, well, there are places where there's digital assets, like meaning imagery, that's easy to integrate into a VR experience. For us, I think a lot of the work 
isn't, unless we have a clear vision for the environment, then we work with Up360 and, and we talk through that. Um, and it's more about the functionality of what we want to do that's the challenge, right? So if you're just going into an environment to walk around, um, I think those are, you know, pretty easy to do quite quickly, but it's the functionality and the tracking of the user's experience and their decision making and the choices and what they do within there that is really the work. So like our carpentry one, we built three different um, experiences in there, but that probably took what, like three years really from start to finish a eh, Harrison, like about a year maybe a year each. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that sounds about right. Yeah, uh, you know, from a visual perspective, like art represents, you know, 25%, if if not a little bit less of, of a build out. Um, it, it's the gameplay programming. Uh, and I say gameplay because, you know, the practices that we follow is, is the same as what you would follow to, you know, develop a game. Um, so it's all those mechanical interactions, you know, the picking up of, uh, of, a, of a nail gun and then the nailing and then, you know, uh, the programming around measuring if they put the nails in the right place versus the wrong place, um, that becomes very uh, complicated and that, that is the majority of the work. Um, for anyone who's interested in just like 3D assets, you know, 3D environments, uh, even our studio to save time and money on the art side will leverage asset packs sometimes. And there's a lot of really good libraries for that, like Turbo Squid, um, you know, Unreal Engine has its own asset store. This is the engine we develop in. Um, so if you're looking for just, you know, assets that can be brought into like a simple web 3D viewer or like a simple, you know, VR environment or like even an AR environment, um, you could do that for relatively low cost. But yeah, the, the time commitments and the resource commitments to build these bigger experiences um, are definitely up there. But the more we build, the quicker it gets. And, you know, now we're at a point where, like, we could build a project with, with St. Lawrence College, you know, within a few months um, when, uh, you know, back when we first started, it would take almost a year to do some of these things. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. It says, uh, were students uploaded into the student information system and received a student number, or do they remain separate as a micro-credential consumer, I guess? So uh, so to all of our students, like, even if they're enrolling through, um, our continuing education would get a student number and they can work through that way. But if they're coming in through, let's say workforce development, they may sometimes not have, I guess, the same <laughs> kind of credential. Um, we still track them, but, um, all, all you would need to log in um, to some of these experiences is an email address and an access code. Okay, thank you. Um, another question uh, that's come in, uh, do you also do augmented reality along with the, uh, the VR? Uh, yeah. What is the example of an AR situation that you have? So I think we've got some augmented reality that is um, focused within that metallurgy. I'd have to go back to that within that metallurgy environment. And there's another one related to like some um, chemistry biotech piece where we have augmented reality. And we're now just working on some augmented reality that is um, uh, about the human interaction. So we've had some initial conversations with um, Up360 about that, but we're not quite there yet yeah we we dabble um but we we find that uh building for something like ar can be like easier time-wise but more challenging from the user experience perspective because a lot of these ar apps um you know if you use the really high-end headsets like you know the the mixed reality hololens uh device or like the magic leap device um they're very early stage and like limited in like their fidelity and like their visual quality. There's a lot of like nuances, like just getting those, those things up and running. Um, and then if you try to deliver it, you know, to say everybody's smartphone, um, you have to factor in, you know, who has a high end device versus a low end device. Um, and then again, you know, those two experiences could be night and day different if somebody's on a low end smartphone versus a high end phone. So, you know, AR for us, um, although we feel like it has a lot of potential applications in, in education until they really get 
the the wearables to a point where you know they're they're super scalable. Um, we're not as actively pursuing that. Uh, we feel like AR is best fit into like you know consumer marketing, you know experiences, little activations, uh, and more immersive web or VR. It really seems to be the best path forward for uh, education with just the current state of hardware. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Have you created for the use of the HoloLens? No, not yet, no. Not, not, uh, not with SLC. We, again, we, we've dabbled, uh, but uh, if not for any of our projects, no. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have a hand up. Uh, Melanie, feel free to open your microphone. All right. Hi, Harrison. How are you? <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see uh, some things that you're working on. Um, so this all, is, this is all very exciting. I am curious and I, I'm, uh, I don't know if, um, maybe I didn't have like multiple meetings back to back today. So I don't know. So the purpose of today is to, is it just like information sharing? Are you, uh, looking for partners to work with? Are you, are these simulations that, that we can try? Um, I'll start with that. Mainly information sharing, but I know Teresa is always, always open to uh, partnerships and collaboration. So I'll let her field that one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like if, if people think there's something that, um, you know, it's budget season too, right? <laughs> so if people think there's something that they really want to collaborate on, I, I think there's definitely like openness to having those conversations for sure. Um, and trying out things, uh, you know, I don't see why we wouldn't, we wouldn't make that possible um we just have to figure out the logistics of that because again we don't necessarily just distribute the files out there they mm -hmm. yeah and, and I'll, I'll add to that um anything that you guys can take from us uh, to avoid some mistakes that we've made over the last you know three or four years uh you know that, that's why we're in it right you know we want to help uh, other other organizations, you know, learn from from our mistakes, you know, learn from our successes, uh, because mistakes are expensive. And, you know, we have a lot of college partners that like, you know, preemptively bought a lot of hardware. And then, you know, the hardware ends up on a shelf somewhere. And then, you know, they kind of come to us and be like, hey, what, what's going on here? Like, why, why don't, what, like, why are we able to use this hardware? Um, and so like purchasing decisions around hardware around like what software is out there there's so many nuances because the industry is moving so fast um for anyone that's just interested in like building a little bit of a strategy and just picking our brains like that that we're here as a resource and we're happy to like you know support in any capacity yeah that's a great point harrison because there are some other things like again if we're buying equipment or there's things that we're wondering about in terms of you know setting up a space or um, functionality, we will reach out to our friends at Up360 and, and ask them questions about that. Yep, yeah, Paul, Paul, uh, Melanie, is there another part of your question? Uh, I'm just curious, yeah, just one more question. Um, if you, Teresa, if, if you guys have done anything in the kind of the healthcare field with Harrison. Um, we're doing a lab right now. Uh, and I'm trying to think what else we've done so our wellness center um depending on like if you're talking um you know allied health i guess um our wellness center has that um capability we've built the environment this goes back to like managing resources <laughs> so in our wellness center we've built the physical environments and then we're moving forward then we'll work with up 360 around different functionalities for different programs um and different professional learnings within there so yeah we're, that's probably a next step for us yeah we, we do have a healthcare related project in the queue right now uh with us slc that's more focused on like traditional healthcare you know emergency services type environments okay excellent thanks for sharing guys yeah no worries Thank you. Uh, Harrison, did you want to address Paul's uh, question there? Just one really quick and then we'll wrap. Yeah, up. yeah. So, so Paul's question was uh, Creative Commons. Um, for a lot of the simulations we showed, a no, because those were kind of pre-campus. 
the platform that we're building though, um, there is uh, going to be a free version of it available for any colleges that need you know, to use that infrastructure for things like content management and content distribution. Um, so there'll be some abilities for colleges to access that. And then there are a few eCampus funded projects uh, that I believe fall under Creative, Creative Commons that we're collaborating with SLC and a few other colleges on. Uh, one for, I believe, Power Engineering, um, and then another one for HVAC uh, that I think will fall into that. So any any colleges that are looking for that type of content, um, you know, can feel free to reach out. And then even if you saw something today that you're interested in that you know we built with SLC, I would say definitely connect with Teresa um, because yeah, we want to just see as many partners use this as possible. She can field the you know the budgetary questions and the you know who gets access to to those ones that are more proprietary to SLC. But we're big proponents of you know collaboration and content sharing because like the end result here is that we have everything in VR and there's no way that like you know we can do this by ourselves and why build something twice right well thank you very much uh, for sharing uh your experiences here today it was very informative uh, i do want to thank everyone here in our audience i hope that uh, and to, to melanie's point earlier kind of the purpose behind these these webinars is really to encourage people to think about these types of assets that's certainly objective of eCampus and to hopefully inspire collaborations and activity in creating I think what is really innovative educational experiences for learners. Uh, I also want to really thank our uh, eCampus Ontario communications team who uh, make these webinars possible and handle all the social media posts and emails we couldn't create these types of experiences uh, without them. Uh, our adaptive learning file uh, is found on our adaptive learning webpage, uh, which uh, the link will be shared uh, in our chat. Uh, today was actually the fourth webinar in our series uh, in the adaptive learning area. Uh, our next webinar is actually coming up on February 22nd, uh, and you can register for that now, and more information will be sent out to individuals on our adaptive learning list to, to register for that. Uh, uh, Lutfia will post a, a link in the chat there so that you can register for that next February 22nd uh, event. And we're gonna be hearing from Georgian College and their implementation of the Sergo adaptive learning platform in their uh, communications courses. So it's a little bit of a different take on adaptive learning. We're trying to keep things uh, uh, as interesting here as possible. Uh, another few quick announcements before we, we go. Uh, our open library is also hosting a series of events. Uh, someone was good enough to post a link in the chat to eCampus Ontario's open library where you can explore our OER collection. Uh, so they are hosting events that will cover things like role play, gamification, bilingual context, and more. Uh, they are also offering virtual drop-in sessions where you can get help with OER, find out more about the OER library, and engage with, with our open library team. Uh, so there's some links uh, Lutfia will post in the chat uh, for their events and how to access that information. Uh, just in terms of other opportunities, uh, Ontario Extend is currently offering live uh, sessions to engage in that micro-credential program to become an empowered educator. So check out our Ontario Extend webpage to enroll uh, in those micro-credentials. They are free. They certainly benefit uh, the, your educational practice and help build uh, connections with other educators across the province. And best yet, we're going to have those live sessions to help you get to that micro-credential. And finally, uh, eCampus Ontario will be hosting our micro-credential forum March 1st to 3rd. Uh, this event will include an in-person session at Toronto's Globe and Mail Centre on March 1st and a virtual event on March 2nd and 3rd. Come out and explore the evolving relationship between micro-credentials and the labour market. Uh, lots of great information to, to, for that. You can purchase tickets and register for this free virtual event by visiting the uh, registration page uh, now being posted in the chat. Uh, I will follow up with everyone registered for today's session with all of these links as well in case you can't grab them because uh, there's lots of great opportunities to put on your calendar uh, as we come here and roll into March. So thank you everyone for attending today. Thank you again to our presenters and I wish you a good rest of the week. Bye now. Thanks, everyone.